the time of the end. And I'm going to be connecting with that fascinating and challenging subject I presented last Sunday night on the mark of the beast. I'm not going to go through all of that material, but it does directly connect. For we discovered in our study that the beast of Revelation 13 represented the papal system that brings the earth to a universal point of crises over the issue of the mark. And we discovered the mark of Rome's authority is the change that she made of the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday in the 4th century A.D. You may remember the statement I share with you from the Catholic record where it says, the church says, Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible and the transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. And my friend, it does, and I'm not going to preach that whole sermon again, but it does matter when it comes to spiritual and religious practices and beliefs. It does matter whether it comes from the book or it does not. And my friend, it is a practice, this matter of Sunday, it is a practice that tra uh, traditionally has been passed down through the ages to our own time. And no question about it, there are many sincere Christians who keep Sunday. They never had a reason to question it. But my friend, it is contrary to what the Bible clearly teaches. Tonight we will begin our study with Revelation 17 that describes this apostate system as a harlot. In contrast, we will discover that God's people in the last days are pointed out in prophecy as a pure virgin woman. A pure virgin woman. And it's interesting, in Bible prophecy, a woman represents the church. On one hand, as I've already st stated, a pure woman represents a pure church, a true church. A, a, an impure woman, a harlot, represents a church that is in apostasy. Take a look at Revelation 17, the New Testament, page 197. Revelation 17, and we're going to begin with verses 1 through 3. So, Revelation 17. And it's interesting, as we study the book of Revelation, to find that we have these contrasts. And we'll see that, again, the harlot on one side of it, and the pure virgin woman on the other. So, here's what we find. Revelation 17, and beginning with verse 1, where it says, Then one of the seven angels, who had the seven bulls, came and spoke with me, saying, Come here. I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality, and those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast full of blasphemous names, having seven hands and ten horns. And once again, we are reminded that the book of Revelation is a book of prophetic symbol, symbolisms in which important and vital truths as it relates to the end times and specifically as it relates to the ebb and flow of this conflict between good and evil plays out. And uh, we find the harlot, the, the prostitute of Revelation 17, plays a major role in prophecy in the end times. In fact, in Hosea 4, verse 12, we have this interesting biblical statement where it says, For a spirit of harlotry has led them astray, and they have played the harlot departing from their God. Now, this is a statement that is made about God's people at a certain period of time in the Old Testament. And they are described as being a harlot, for they have departed from their God. And so as we look at the harlot of Revelation 17, this represents a people, a church, that have departed because of apostasy from loyalty to God, is what the Bible clearly, clearly indicates. And we continue as we come down to verse 9, where it says, Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. We're given some keys to identifying the woman. And geographically, it's speaking about the woman being located at a place where there are seven mountains. And verse 18 gives us another key as we drop down there, where it says, The woman whom you saw is what? What is it? It's the great city. And what about this city? 
it says, which reigns over the kings of the earth. So put it together. A great city located at a place of seven mountains or hills that we know historically has reigned over the kings of the earth, or that is, has dominated the civil system. And what are we talking about? Or who are we talking about? We are talking about Rome. You know, the site of seven mountains, that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Again, it is the Antichrist is what we find. Now, I take you back to the latter part of verse 1. We just kind of read over it very quickly to set the stage for the study tonight. But I want to point out very, uh, something very essential about the harlot as described here. Last part of verse, uh, chapter 1, I'm sorry, chapter 17 and verse 1, where it says, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. She is going to be held accountable in the end time, is what the Bible indicates. And it goes on to say, verse 2, with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality. Now, again, is this talking in literal, literalistic terms? No. I mean, really, the language in the original language is talking about sexual immorality. And it's not talking literally between the woman and the kings of the earth. It's talking spiritually. She has prostituted herself spiritually. And it is speaking of the unholy union between church and state, which was one of the hallmarks of the apostate system, the union of church and state. And as you look at this, particularly through the, uh, through the Middle Ages, my friend, it was often through the civil powers that the apostate church exercised its power over the masses of the people, the populations of the old world. That union of church and state. By the way, we have here in America a unique understanding of the relationship between church and state, which I'll get to in a few moments. But we drop on down to verses 4 and 5, where it says, The woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a gold cup full of abominations and of the unclean things of her immorality. And again, we're talking in coded terms, in symbolic terms. She has this cup. And verse 5 says, And on her forehead a name was written, a mystery, Babylon the Great. And so we have three figures in the book of Revelation that are talking about the same system. Revelation 13 speaks of it as a beast. Revelation 17 here speaks of it as the harlot. And it's also referred in prophecy in the book of Revelation as Babylon the Great. Three symbols for the same apostate system. But she has in her hands the cup of her immorality. And usually it talks about the wine of her immorality. And my friend, it creates a spiritual stupor on those who drink from the cup. What would possibly be in that cup? Well, I believe that in part it represents Satan's deceptions. The, the apostasy away from the truth of God's word. Substituting the traditions and the decorations of the church councils and the authority of the church for the authority that resides alone in the scriptures. Furthermore, I believe it includes a substitution for the true salvation that comes to us by faith in Jesus Christ. A system that is based on works. And it is a system that's based on works. And we see as we look at the system that it has a counterfeit priestly ministry as opposed to Jesus, Jesus' high priestly ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. And then, of course, it has a false Sabbath. It has, it has substituted Sunday, which comes to us with the marks of apostasy in it, for it was out of the apostasy of the church that, the, that Sunday, which comes straight out of paganism, was substituted for the worship of God on the seventh-day Sabbath. And so we have a counterfeit Sabbath. And really, the list probably could go on, but that would be some of the things. And uh, as we look at verse 5, as, as it talks about uh, she is Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, 
and of the abominations of the earth. And if, as we've already stated, a woman represents churches, an impure woman represents an impure church, an apostate church, when it talks about the mother of harlots, what would the harlots be? But those churches that continue in a state of apostasy. Now, I'm not going to give you a list. That's not my business to go through and give you lists. But there are those who participate in the apostasy. And, some, and often unknowingly, particularly as it relates to this whole issue of the Sabbath and Sunday. But she is called the mother of harlots. In fact, the church of Rome claims to be the mother church. You've heard that term, haven't you? The mother church. And you know there's a reason why some 500 years ago the Reformation took place. Because there was a recognition among sincere Christians as they studied the Bible, they began to discover how far the church, the established church, had gone down the road of apostasy. And they sought to reform the church. But the church would not be reformed, right? It would not be reformed. But today, you know, the movement is back. The ecumenical movement is back to the mother church. And you see, the less that the Bible plays a foundational role in the spiritual life of a church and in the spiritual life of an individual, the fewer reasons remain for us to remain separated from Rome. I mean, you know, just think that through. In fact, you can see here, Pope Benedict XVI, as he met with the Bishop of Canterbury, the Archbishop of Canterbury, the, you know, the uh, spiritual leader of the Church of England, I mean, there's all these attempts of reaching out to reestablish these connections, you uh, know, historically. And again, uh, as we look at the Orthodox world that represented here in the picture, again, this reaching out, this, this, this idea of coming back together. My friend, we'll look at a prophecy and we will discover how God intends to deal with the divisiveness and the confusion that has gripped the Christian world. And it is not through the ecumenical movement that it's going to happen. For the ecumenical movement, if you really take a look at it, is based on compromise, compromise of biblical truth. And my friend, re being reunited as Christians will never be based upon compromise of truth. It will, be, take, a pl it will take place, I'll give you this much insight, our coming together as God's people, no matter what our church backgrounds may be, will happen as a sweeping revival takes place among God's people in the various churches. And then we will come together in perfect union. And that's the only way. And that revival will lead to a revival of the centrality of the authority of Scripture among God's people. That is an essential part of it. And you go on, here we have the head of the World Council of Churches meeting with Pope Benedict XVI. Ah, years ago, I was home visiting my family up there in Auburn, Washington. That's in the Seattle area. We were relaxing in the family room on a Sunday, Sunday morning, late morning, early afternoon. And uh, we were all going through the Seattle Times, working through it page by page, and I eventually came to the community page, and in the community page, I saw that there was going to be an ecumenical service at St. James Cathedral, which is the main cathedral for the Catholic diocese in Seattle. And I told my mother, I said, I'm, I'm going to go. I'm going to be there. I want to see this. And she said, I'm going to go with you. So we, we made our way to Seattle, and uh, here's St. James Cathedral right there. Those stained glass windows, it looked to me, were made out of gold. It looked like gold, and, and I think probably was gold. And we were there early. We found our place, and it was clear. The, the cathedral was just packed, and it was clear that there were many Christians other than Roman Catholics that were present. For you see, they were there to sign a document between the Roman Catholic Diocese of Seattle and Bishop Raymond Hunthausen was the bishop of the Catholic Diocese of that period of time, and Robert Cochran, who was the bishop of the 
of the Episcopal Church, the Episcopal Diocese. They had a commission that had been studying for two years how these two dioceses could come together in union. And they had made enough progress, they were ready to sign some documents over this whole thing. So here we are, where it's packed full, and that organ began to play behind us. It was beautiful, and the choir began to sing. It was almost heavenly. And then in gorgeous attire, in these beautiful vestments, came these two bishops, Robert Cochran, the Episcopalian bishop, and Raymond Hunthausen, the uh, bishop of the Catholic diocese there, led by a young man in a white Cossack, and he had, he was swinging a burning censer. That censer was about that big around, and there were three chains that went to the handle. He was singing, swinging that thing around 360 degrees as he came down in temple to that beautiful music. But he not only did it on this side, he'd been practicing this, I know. He not only did it on this side of his body, but with the same hand, he did it on this side. I mean, that would take some practice, wouldn't it? In fact, some who were sitting on the inside aisle, looking back, seeing this man coming down with this big swinging censer, some of them moved in a little bit, you know, into the inside, but he didn't miss a beat. And then they went through the formalities of signing these documents publicly, and in so doing, talking about healing the wound. It just fascinates me how that term that comes out of Revelation 13 often comes up in these kinds of settings. This is the interior of St. James Cathedral. It is, a, as I said already, a beautiful, beautiful cathedral there in Seattle, Washington. Beautiful cathedral. But in contrast to the harlot of Revelation 17 is this pure woman of Revelation 12. That's the New Testament, page 195. Revelation chapter 12, and beginning with verse 1, where it says, And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. Remember last Saturday night we studied about the 144,000, and I took note of the fact that in Bible prophecy, whenever you see the number 12, it is always associated with God's covenant people, with His true people. In the Old Testament, it was from the 12 patriarchs that we have the 12 tribes that constitute ancient Israel, God's people under the Old Covenant. And in the New Testament, it is from the 12 apostles that we have the establishment of the Christian church. And so again, the number 12 is associated with God's covenant people. That's what's being pictured here in Revelation 12 and verse 1. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 2, Paul says, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband, that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. And so here we see God's people are pictured prophetically in the end time. And who, have, and who are we betrothed to as a people of God? To Jesus Christ. It just keeps, you know, as you study the Bible, when you really think, uh, study it in light of the plan of salvation, my friend, it is always taking us back to the relationship with Jesus, with God through Jesus, right? It always does. And that is one of the primary things that sets them apart as the people of God. They are in a committed relationship. And I trust you're in a committed relationship to Jesus Christ. It is a growing relationship. It may not be perfect because we're not perfect, right? You know, none of us have attained however we are in the relationship, and the relationship is a saving one. And it sets us apart as the people of God, doesn't it? It sets us apart as the people of God. It's something that is born within the heart of an individual that responds to the love and grace of Jesus. And, uh, and we enter into that covenant relationship that's all involved here as we talk about this woman here in Revelation 12. But one of the things that we find in Revelation 12 
we find the church in a state of conflict. And I want you to notice the context of Revelation 12. It is the chapter just before Revelation 13. And Revelation 13 is the chapter that deals with the Antichrist, the papal system. So the setting is that the people of God are going to find themselves in a state of conflict. It points out in verses 7 through 9 that the source of this conflict began in heaven. But then it points out that the conflict continues here, particularly in the past and in the, and the end times. The conflict continues to play itself out here upon this planet. Oh, my friend, I wish I could assure you that as we come to Jesus Christ and as we deepen our experience in Jesus, that we, you know, we can just relax. That's just going to be all peace and all joy. But, my friend, when you and I come to Jesus Christ, we put ourselves in a position that leads us into conflict with the evil one. And remember, we're the objects of his hatred because we are the objects of his infinite love. That's what it really comes down to. And so I want to tell you, I know the devil is angry whenever the people of God get together in these kind of settings to sincerely seek the truth of Scripture in a way to understand more clearly the dynamics of the relationship that we are in 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 relationship to Jesus Christ. He hates it. He doesn't want us to come to an understanding of these things in God's Word. And so, my friend, he sets it up. I see this often in meetings, and sometimes I don't see it, but it's going on. Conflict, people in conflict. Some of you may find yourselves in conflict as we have proceeded in these meetings. And at some point, you may find yourself in conflict as we move towards the end of the meetings. As you're making up your mind, you know, what does this mean to me? You know, what should I do with all of these things that I'm, I'm learning? What's the implications of it? But that's what Revelation 12 tells us. The people of God will be in conflict, and that's what we see in verse 6. Verse 6. It says, Then the woman fled. Fled where? It says, Into the wilderness. Take a look at that word, Fled. What do you get from that word fled? What's the dynamic that's going on there? The woman is fleeing. It gives us the idea the woman is running. She is fleeing for her life. Something is threatening her that leads her to flee into the wilderness. Again, this is prophetic language, but fleeing into the wilderness, notice it says, where she had a place prepared by God. And my friend is talking about that period of oppression and persecution. I'll put it together in just a moment. That period of oppression and persecution I referred to briefly last Sunday night. And as it was true in the past, history will repeat itself in the end time. But just as assuredly as the past that God had a place for his people where he would shelter them during times of oppression, be assured of it. God will shelter his people. He has a pray, place prepared for us when we will be faced with persecution. You know, we have it too easy in the United States, don't we? It costs us little. It costs us little to be Christians. But we went back in medieval times, and if it meant, you know, you're going to be true to Christ and to his, to his word, or you're going to be burned at the stake, which happened a lot, then this becomes a lot more serious. How much do I really believe this? You know, am I willing to give up my life for it? That is not something that we should try to quickly answer, right? I'm not sure that any of us know our hearts that well, but we do know that we can rely on Jesus, our Savior, who has prepared a place for us. Anyway, so then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so that there she might be, notice the word, nourished for 1,260 days. Interesting, God's people, the church, under oppression, in conflict. Nevertheless, God has a place where he will nourish his people. 
He will nourish his people. And it says for 1,260 days. It's a prophetic period of time. And we saw it for the first time last Sunday night in regards to the mark of the beast. 1,260 days. We remember the principle is in Ezekiel 4, verse 6, where it says, I have appointed the each day for a year. And again, one prophetic day represents a literal year. And 1,260 prophetic days, therefore, represent 1,260 years. That is a long period of time in which it says the church, the people of God, would be in hiding to this place that God's prepared for her where she would be nourished for 1,260 years. This prophecy is repeated, this time prophecy, more than any other in the Bible. It's repeated in the Old and in the New Testament, 1260 years. And you will remember from last Sunday night as we studied this in Revelation 13, the 1260 years represented the period of time in which the apostate church, the apostate system would reign supreme, reaching from 538 to 1798 when it would receive a deadly wound. And my friend, there's a reason why the church, the true people of God, had to go into hiding, fleeing into the wilderness during the supremacy of the apostate church. For remember, one of the identifying characteristics of it is that it would make war with the saints. And it was not easy for me to recount this history. None of us really, you know, who wants to talk about some of the ugly things that were done, but... The church did seek to purge the old world culture and society of the hated heretics. And they thought they sought to do it in terms that would put the fear of God in anybody who thought that they would depart from the authority of the church, burn somebody at the stake, and let all the people gather around and watch them burn. The love of Jesus burned more brightly in their hearts. And let me tell you, it would take a lot of love, wouldn't it? But I want to tell you, there are so many martyrs that bore testimony to their faith in Christ who were willing to pay the ultimate price. There's that statement in Scripture. Jesus says, my grace is sufficient for you. And I believe there's a special grace that comes. I, some people represent martyrdom. As, as one of the gifts that God gives to an individual, that they're able to have the strength to be martyred. We have it too easy in this country. It costs us little. And then I want to take you to verses 13 and 14. For it repeats it, what we just read, and whenever something's repeated, it's because it's vital, it's important. Verse 13, And when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, and you know the dragon is the devil himself, he persecute, persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. That uh, child is talking about Jesus, isn't it? Verse 14, but the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman so that she could fly into the wilderness. There's the wilderness again, to her place where she was, and again it says, where she was nourished. You see the parallelisms? Between verse 6 and verse 14, it's repeating the same thing. And again, repetition is to give us emphasis on, on the experience of God, God's people. It says, where she, would, she was nourished for, now notice the language, a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent, that is from the evil one. Now, the original language is more exact than the translation. For in the original language, it means one time or one year of prophetic time, two years, and half a year. That's a total of three and a half years of prophetic time. And in a prophetic year, there are 360 days. And if you multiply three and a half years times 360, you come up with the same prophetic period of time as in verse 6. That is 1,260 prophetic days or years. It's another way of referring to the time prophecy of verse 6. And so, again, she's fleeing into, into the wilderness to that place that was prepared for her by God. I heard it said, it's been some years ago, and I think the research shows there's, there's much more of this than we, than we appreciate in the book of Revelation. 
but I heard it in a lecture that there are some 600 direct or indirect references to the Old Testament in the book of Revelation. And as I said, scholarship has found there's even more, which helps me to understand why there are many that have such a tough time with the book of Revelation when many New Testament believers take the position that the Old Testament really is not that relevant. But think of it, 600 ref direct or indirect references to the Old Testament in the, in, uh, in the book of Revelation. I'm going to give you an illustration of what's happening here. Because this idea of three and a half years, the woman fleeing into the wilderness where she's to be nourished by God, comes straight out of the Old Testament, and it goes straight to the story of the prophet Elijah. And just as we have the supremacy of the apostate church, so we find in the Old Testament that the people of God were in apostasy. This is coming down to the time of King Ahab and wicked Queen Jezebel. And they were hunting down the prophets and they were killing them. And they would have killed Elijah except God preserved him. And after delivering his message that there would be no rain because of their sin, Elijah was led out into the wilderness to the place that God had prepared for him. And he was nourished. Remember how the ravens is pictured here? brought him food, there was a brook for water, and for the next three and a half years, though Ahab was hunting him down among the various nations there in what we call the Middle East, and was unsuccessful in finding him, for three and a half years, God protected and nourished him. That imagery is picked up and is applied to God's people, as we've just noted. Kind of interesting as you look at it. But there's more as we continue on in verse 15. For in verse 15 it says, And the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman so that he might cause her to be swept away with the flood, a flood of op oppression and persecution. And let me ask you, how determined is the evil one? Well, he's determined. But how patient and enduring in his love and patience is the one that we serve. My friend, God will outlast him. He may be determined, determined, but God is even more determined. And in patience, he works out his will, doesn't he? So, again, verse 15, he pours out this river of persecution and oppression against the people of God. And then notice verse 16, it says, But the earth, the earth helped the woman. And the earth opened its mouth and drank up the river which the dragon poured out of his mouth. And again, the symbolism here is fascinating as you look at it, as you interpret it. The earth helps the woman. What could that be talking about? Well, let's go back to Revelation 17 and verse 15 on the screen where it tells us prophetically what waters represent. And if we can understand what waters represent, we can understand what the earth, the very opposite in meeting would represent. It says, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits, where it's located at, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. My friend, that is talking about the old world, which was the center and the basis of Western civilization for so many centuries. In contrast, what would the earth that helps the woman? What would the earth represent? It would be the very opposite. And as such, represents the new world, which was, you know, there were Indians here, but it was not heavily populated, was it? It was a wilderness. The earth helped the woman. And my friend, this just, this just draws us into the history of it. it. You know, what is it that was moving the pilgrims, you know, 1620 and all of that? What was drawing many of the peoples to this country? Well, I do know, you and I know historically, it happens even to this day, there was economic benefit that some saw in the New World. But many came to the New World because they wanted to be able to worship God in accordance with their own conscience. For they were denied that privilege in the Old World. For remember, this union between church and state that dominated the affairs of the Old World for so long. And if you didn't belong, belong to the established church, the established church, the state church, 
you were not allowed to worship God in accordance with what you thought. You had to comply to the dictates of the church and the state. That's a historical fact. And my friend, out of the Reformation came this idea that we ought to be able to worship God in accordance with our own conscience, free of the dictates of the state and the dictates of the church. We take this for granted because we have lived in this system. But it is a novel idea historically, and it is novel as you look at it worldwide. This is not the way that it is in much of the world. You are not in certain parts of the world allowed to worship God in accordance to the dictates of your own conscience. The Reformation was based upon that idea, and you know it got embedded here in the New World, didn't it? As they came, just think of it, as they crossed the Atlantic, not in 747s, they were in these small little boats. It took them months. They were uprooting themselves out of everything they knew, civilization as they known it from family and friends. They were giving up their jobs, often houses and lands. And what was motivating them? Oh, my friend, there weren't condos waiting for them and plush jobs waiting for them. But they thought, we're going to make a new start and we're going to have a new order of things here where we can worship God as we choose. And that's what motivated many of our forefathers to come here, right? It was. I mean, it's a genius of what came to be the United States. It was foundational. Roger Williams encapsulated this idea of religious freedom, the first in the uh, colony of Rhode Island. And this, this, this is the concept he had. You know, many as they came to the New World said, you know, I want to have the right to worship God according to my conscience, but those guys down there, they're a little weird. They ought not to have that right. And so they did some of the persecuting themselves. But he had this idea that everyone ought to have that right. And this is what it says, Roger Williams established in Rhode Island the principle, and I quote now, that every man should have liberty to worship God according to the light of his own conscience. He was way ahead of his time. And yet that principle got embedded into our Constitution. And an important part of that process was in setting up a new order of things here in the New World was this idea that the church and the state should remain separate. That the state should not be involved in establishing or involved in the affairs of the church. Did I say that right? Okay, the state should not be, yeah. By the way, it's a two-way street, nor should the church be using the powers of the state for its purpose. So we have this division between church and state in this country. And my friend, it has served us well. So the earth helped the woman. And where the woman was in hiding for 1260 years, as she came to the new world, she could then come out openly to worship God freely. And it was here in this place of freedom that the people of God became manifest let me tell you, the dragon, here he still is, verse 17. He still hasn't given up. My friend, he's not going to give it up until God says it's done and it is done. Verse 17, so the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. The King James, which is a pretty good translation, uh, puts it in these words, and I'm using this translation for one key word. It says that the dragon was wroth, or angry, with the woman and went to make war with the remnant. Is that word remnant? Because that is truly the word here. The remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. The remnant. What is a remnant? Have you ever been to a remnant sale, ladies? You know, I don't know if some of you do a little bit of sewing or stuff. My, my wife is a seamstress, you know. She, she made her own wedding dress. And uh, so, you know, when you're, when you're getting the remnant off a bolt of cloth, what are you getting, the first, middle, or last part? The last. The last. 
And so when it talks about the remnant of her seed, speaking of the church, what does that mean? Well, it's talking about the remnant of God's people in that last remnant of time that is in the last days. Are you with me? That's the picture. We've been following this, haven't we, from verses 13 and 14. You know, the woman has fled in the wilderness. That's the 1260 years. That's behind us, actually. Then renewed persecution. The earth helps the woman. We fit that. We fit that in historically, the new world, the establishment of the United States and its principles that it stands on. But then verse 17 tells us again, the dragon as the end is approaching and he knows it's almost over. My friend does not give up in discouragement. He is enraged and is determined to take the people of God down, the remnant, to take the remnant down. My friend, we're in conflict. Conflict without and sometimes conflict within is what the Bible tells us. And uh, notice the two identifying characteristics that we find here of God's people in the end time, in the last remnant of time. It speaks of they will have the testimony of Jesus. I'm going to spend a whole evening on that tomorrow night, the testimony of Jesus. But what's the other thing that is noted here about the people of God? What is it that they're keeping? They're keeping the commandments of God. That's what the book of Revelation tells us. And my friend, if they're keeping the commandments, again, I've asked the question before, how many of the commandments do you think they're keeping? Do you think they're being selective about this matter of the commandments? I like this one, like this one, Lord, this one, this one, this one, that's all right, but this one, no. Is that, is that, is, is that the, character, the character of God's people in the end time? No. In their love for Jesus, they are seeking by his grace to keep all ten of the commandments, which tells me if they're keeping the commandments that they are a Sabbath-keeping people. Let me tell you, this message is going to go to the whole world. It's a part of the gospel message. It's going to go to the whole world, and in the end, all of God's people are going to take their stand for the truth that we find in the Bible, and because they take their stand for the truth, they will become all Sabbath-keeping Christians. Yes, it's going to happen. There's a reason why Sabbath-keeping Christians are among the fastest-growing Christians in the world today. There's a reason. My friend, it has the ring of truth in it. It's the ring of truth. Now, I've got to take you to Daniel. It's the Old Testament, page 640. For this time prophecy, 1260 years, is repeated here. But it gives us a different orientation to the 1260 years as it relates to the great prophecies, particularly of the book of Daniel and Revelation. So Daniel 12 and verse 4. Are you there? Daniel 12, verse 4. Now, you'll see the reference to the 1260 years in just a moment. But it says, but as for you, Daniel, conceal these words and seal at the book until the end of time. Many will go back and forth and knowledge will increase. And so the prophecies that Daniel was given and that are contained in this book, that is the book of Daniel, Daniel was told to seal it up. It would be sealed until the end of time which indicates that in the end of time, the book would be unsealed, right? At some point, it would become relevant. At some point, it would be unsealed. And he said, it says at that time, many, in the end time, many will go back and forth, and knowledge will increase. Oh, my friend, this isn't talking about jet travel and rockets, and I've heard this, this application. No, it's talking about that there would be people that would be studying the Word of God who would be going back and forth through the Scriptures. And as they go back and forth through the Scriptures, truth would increase. Knowledge would increase. And have you noticed for four weeks, we have been doing that. We've been going back and forth through the Word of God. And as we've been going back and forth through the Word of God, knowledge has increased. It's always the way it does when the Spirit of God is at work. Verse 5, Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others were standing, one on this bank of the river, and the other on that bank of the river. And one said to the man, dressed in linen, notice, notice what's coming who was above the waters of the river. Here's the question. How long will it be until the end of these wonders? 
until the end of what wonders? Well, the wonders contained in the prophecies of the book of Daniel. How long? It's dealing with the issue of time. And notice the answer. We come to verse 7. I heard the man dressed in linen who was above the waters of the river as he raised his right hand and his left toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever that it would be for a time, times, and half a time. Where did we see that? Revelation 12. It's a reference to the 1260 years. How long will it be until the end of these wonders? That is, until the end time? My friend, the answer is found in the 1260 years, which ended in 1798, which means that since 1798, we have been in the end times. Now we say, oh, that's a long time. Yes, in our very limited human way of looking at time, it may seem like a long time. But we've been in the last days for quite a while. And it would be in this period of time that the book of Daniel would be unsealed. I'm going to share this with you historically. That's where I'm going, but I'm not done yet. Uh, it would be for time, times, and half a time. And as soon as they finish shattering the power of the holy people, that's talking about the people of God, it's talking about the fact that they would be under oppression for the 1260 years, and it would come to an end, that period of oppression. The new world would help the woman. We put that all together, 1776, 1798. It all fits prophetically and historically. It says all the event, these events will be completed. After this period of per persecution, then we would see the signs of the end being fulfilled. We would see these prophecies being fulfilled. Got it? It's exactly what it says. Verse 8, as for me, I heard but could not understand. So I said, my Lord, what would be the outcome of these events? He said, go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up until the end of time. And my friend, it happened just right on time, just as we saw indicated here. If indeed these prophecies of Daniel would be unsealed in the time of the end, and that happened in 1798, we entered the end time, somewhere in the 19th century, the following century, 1798, you don't have much left of the 18th century. So somewhere in the 19th century, and probably in the soil of the New World, we would find this phenomena in which the prophecies of Daniel would be unsealed, which takes me to the historical story of William Miller in the early 19th century, the early 1820s and 30s, Born in Pittsfield, Massachusetts in 1782, his grandfather was a Baptist preacher, so he was a Baptism background. And it's quite a story, but I'm going to make it brief to get to the main point. Who came to a point in his life that he determined if the Bible was really true, he was going to find it out for himself. You know, he, he was hearing plenty of the confusing interpretations by the various churches. And so he determined, he took a cruden's concordance, he determined to study the Bible and go verse by verse, and he determined to let the Bible interpret itself. And in due process, he came to the book of Daniel and was the first, I believe, through the power of the Holy Spirit to discover the fundamental truths of these prophecies that we've been studying in part in this seminar. And eventually began to preach it the prophecies, the end point of the prophecies were the coming of Jesus. And it appeared to him as he studied the prophecies that Jesus was to come in their time and in their day. And Daniel had a vision, a vision from God. And he said, I was frightened and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, your wisdom belongs to the end of time. In the mid-19th century, a Baptist preacher, William Miller, traveled the country preaching that the second coming of Christ was close at hand. Tens of thousands believed he was right. The pivotal text that William Miller centered his apocalyptic lectures on was Daniel 8.14, unto 2,300 days and then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Cleansed! And he thought the sanctuary was the earth, and it would be cleansed by the fires of the second coming. 
Miller's followers determined the cleansing would come on a single date, October 22, 1844. By the way, let me give you a little bit of footnote. The Baptists have had a lot to do with the what came to be known as the Advent message. For William Miller was preaching these prophecies in all of the churches among Presbyterians and Congregationalists and Baptists, and you go on down the list. It was a interdenominational movement to begin with. And those who, and who responded to his message came to be known as Advent, Adventists, because they kept talking about the Advent of Christ. They were stirred because, you know, prophecy was something that wasn't being studied out in that period of time. You know, they didn't talk about the coming of Jesus in the churches. And it still goes on today. In some churches, they don't really talk much about the return of Jesus. So it stirred people. Jesus did not come as expected. We call this the great disappointment. And when Jesus failed to come, Hiram Etzen in the historical book, The Midnight Cry, said it probably best. Our fondest hopes and expect expectations were blasted, and such a spirit of weeping came over us as I never experienced before. It seemed that the loss of all earthly friends could have been no comparison. We wept and wept till the day dawned. It was truly a bitter experience. Tie in Revelation 10. The New Testament, page 194, Revelation 10. See, we too are going to and fro, right? We'll go to and fro. Well, we're dependent. Revelation, Daniel, back to Revelation. And Revelation 10, this really puts it all together, where it says, And I saw, I saw another strong angel coming down out of heaven, clothed with a cloud, and the rainbow was upon his head, and his face was like the sun. This is prophetic language. And his feet like pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book which was opened. I wonder what book that would be. Could that possibly be Daniel? You'll see. He placed his right foot on the sea and his left on the land. And he cried out with a loud voice as when a lion roars. And when he had cried out, the seven peals of thunder uttered their voices. And it was in reference to the message of that open book that they uttered. Verse 4, when the seven peals of thunder had spoken, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up the things which the seven peals of thunder have spoken, and do not write them. What was Daniel told to do? Seal up the book. What was John told to do when he heard the words being uttered in reference to the message of that open book? Seal it up. Why? It's for the end time. It was not for John's time either. Seal it up. Verse 5, Then the angel whom I saw standing on the scene on the land lifted up his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who creates heaven and the things in it and the earth and the things in it and the sea and the things in it, that there will be delay. The word in the Greek is chronos. It means time. There will be time no longer. It means we're in the time of the end, if there's going to be time no longer. Verse 7, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, the end is right at hand. At the, at the end of the sevens. In the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he's about to sound, then the mystery of God is finished. It's the mystery of salvation. The gospel message will be completed just before the end, as he ends on us. As he preached to his servants the prophets, that the voice which I heard from heaven I heard again speaking with me and saying, Go, take the book which is opened in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the land. And so I went to the angel telling him to give me the little book, and he said to me, Take it and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and I ate it. I absorbed it. I synthesized it. I made it a part of me. I digested it. I ate it, and in my mouth it was sweet as honey. And when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. In reference to the little book, in reference to those Advent believers, as they so joyously anticipated the return of Jesus, and their joy was turned into bitter disappointment when he did not come in their day as they thought. My friend, it's all there in the book. It is in prophecy. God has a people. We've seen tonight 
at the end of the 1260 years that stretch from 538 to 1798. From that point, we have discovered tonight, we entered into the end of times. We're in that period of time in which the end will come. We don't know the day or the hour. We don't, but we're in that time. We discovered tonight that we didn't be in the time of the end, that God's people would emerge out of hiding. The new world would help the woman. And concurrently as they emerge, the prophecies of Daniel would be unsealed. And my friend, that's the basis of the Advent movement. It's, based, it's a prophetic movement that is based on these prophecies and the prophecies themselves which are centered in what Jesus did for us at the cross of Calvary. I keep saying it. You can't understand and appreciate prophecy properly without appreciating the fact that it was all made possible because of what Jesus did at the cross of Calvary. And at Calvary, it declares to us an end is going to take place, an end of sin, an end of suffering. And it declares that the end, Jesus will come and he will take his people to himself and we will enter into glory. What a wonderful future Jesus purchased for us at Calvary. Don't you want to be there tonight? Aren't you glad that God has given us these insights into his word? and into these prophecies that we can understand these things. I know this is a little deeper than some of the subjects, but my friend, we would expect that in the Word of God. Some things lying on the surface, other things that we dig into, and as we do, we get, gain these deeper understandings and comprehensions of the purpose of God in the end time for His people. 